Croeso pawb yma hyn yma, bod ni um, wedi cyffroi yn lân i ddweud y gwir yn cael Sylvia um, yn ymuno fo ni i drafod um, ei bywyd a i hanas a'i um, daliadau. Um, bod ni hefyd yn cael Catrin Ashton yn cwestiynu Sylvia ar yn rhan sydd yn wych. Mae um, Catrin wedi sgwennu i Undod ag i Pedro Gwent a nifer fawr iawn o lefydd eraill. Felly, bod ni'n falch iawn o Grysawu hi hefyd. Um, we're very excited tonight to welcome Sylvia to speak with us um, here and um, we're also very glad to have Katrin with us who will be questioning Sylvia on our behalf. Um, before we go forward I'm just going to set out a few house rules. So um, if you have any questions you wish to ask um, we ask that you put them in the chat. Um, and we'll hopefully get time to get to them at the very end. Um, we will have um, hopefully 40 minutes or so of conversation and then um, the chatting at the end. Um, Hefyd, does gan ni ddim cyfieithydd hyn yma, we don't have a translator tonight. Therefore, the um, interview is going to be in English. I mean, I drio siarad chod i bach o wenglish, um, bod pan i'r cyfarfod fel dan ni'n mynd, I will speak both Welsh and English at each end of the meeting as we go. Um, un o'r rhesym a mwyaf da ni yn cael y cyfarfod yma hyn yma, ydy ni gael ansio... Um, ymgyrch newydd gen Undod sydd yn galw am gyflog i ofalwyr neu'r hieni neu unrhyw un sydd um, wedi goro a berthu um, gwaith cyfogedig er mwyn gofalu am eraill. Doedd ni hefyd yn galw am uh, bensiwn i unigolion sydd wedi gorfod bod allan o waith cyfogedig am gyfnod tra'n gofalu. Felly mae o'n gyffroes iawn i ni ein bod ni'n gallu um, lansio'r ymgyrch fel yma. Dwi'n mynd i drosglwyddo chi drosod o i Catrin iddi hi gael trafod mwy cyflwyno hi hun a Sylvia a wedyn nhw'n ymlaen o fy'r cwsynau. So, tonight we are having this event in order to launch our new campaign which we'll be calling for wages for carers and parents or anyone who has had to um, sacrifice paid employment in order to care for others. Um, uh, Hopefully, also, we will be asking or calling for um, pension to be paid to those individuals who are um, caring, who have had to step out of paid employment in order to care for others. I'm going to transfer you over to Catherine now, um, who will introduce herself and introduce Sylvia, and then we'll get on with the questions. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the noise in the background. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone and hello Sylvia. Hello, hello Catherine. Um, it's, I'm really excited that you're here with us this evening um, and it's this afternoon for you. You're in New York so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have to say that you yeah just well first of all before we begin I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you've done over over the, all the years um it's it was such an inspiration for many people and myself included um I first I first came across your work through Maria Rosa de la Costa's essay the power of women and the subversion of the community and I read it at a at the perfect time really because I'd been at home for a few months with a new baby and the thing that struck me was uh, how little anything had changed in the 40 years between well almost 40 years between the time you'd written this work and the time of me having a baby and I'd grown up with this idea of feminism uh, that didn't really seem to apply now that I had a baby and because my job involved traveling I I gave that up and I was suddenly at home with no transport <laughs> with no money uh, of my own and yeah, it was a very strange situation to be in quite suddenly um so and then I was led to your work so I, and our campaign in Wales has been absolutely inspired by the work that you did with wages for housework um so I suppose to begin, I was wondering if you could maybe briefly 
just explain, I know you've spoken about this a lot and you've written in depth about it, but maybe just give an overview of that campaign and maybe start with why you got involved yourself. You know, what was the inspiration behind your particular involvement? Yes, thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you to, you know, all those who are listening and those who have helped to bring about this event. And I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, certainly at the beginning of your campaign. You know, uh, our campaign began in the early 1970s and it was from women from different parts, mostly Italy, some women from England and then uh, me, I was in the United States, I'm originally from, England, from Italy. And uh, I think it was uh, really uh, the, the Wages for Household campaign was a kind of alternative to the strategies that many feminists were organizing you know, uh, as, a, as a path to women's liberation. And uh, the dominant trend at the time within the feminist movement was uh, you know, a trend mostly coming from the tradition of the left. Actually, you had two trends. You know, one was the radical feminists who had an understanding of uh, women's oppression that uh, basically identified this system, patriarchy, but it was never clearly defined. You know, patriarchy, the dominance of men, it was never clearly defined how historically, you know, had evolved. Uh, and uh, the strategy of radical feminists usually was to create cultural spaces that would be, you know, mostly uh, women's spaces. But then you had the, the socialist feminists, Marxist feminists, who basically told us that the way to liberation was to go out, take away jobs, and join the working class. And the problem you know, with women discrimination on the basis of gender originated from women's confinement to domestic work. And the argument was domestic work is work that is not producing any social wealth. Domestic work is a kind of more backward kind of activity. It's really not part of the capitalist organization of work. And because it is not part of the capitalist organization of work, women who are mostly involved with this work do not have the power to change the society. You know, men, for instance, can withdraw their labor. They can go on strike because they are producing capital and they can stop capital. You know, so the argument was basically what we need to do. And this was the argument that you find in Marx, in Engels, and the whole Marxist communist tradition. Women's liberation is going out, join the union, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I came from a whole a set of feminists who began to do an analysis and of uh, you know, the, the condition of women's work, of domestic work. And we came to very, very different conclusions. The conclusion we came is that domestic work, housework, is actually extremely important part of the capitalist organization of work. That what is being produced through housework, you know, it's uh, the workers themselves. You know, in other words, we began to see that the capitalist organization of work, as described by the left tradition, was a very partial one because it only saw production and wage labor, production, industrial production, office work. It only saw wage labor and it only saw the production of goods. It never saw the whole organization of the production of the worker, the production of the capacity to work. So for us, wages for housework, I just want to say this. For us, the campaign for wages for housework had many meanings. First of all, it meant to make visible the work, to make visible that this work is not 
just uh, a natural activity, you know, something that women do because they are women, is not the leftover of a pre-capitalist society, but is actually work that is central to every activity, to every economic activity. So for us to say, we want to wait for this work because we are producing, we are working for the same employers that wage workers are working. In fact, housework is the support system, is the pillar of every economic activity. So this was one aspect, is not the only one, not the only goal of the campaign, but certainly it was very central. It was an epistemic strategy to make visible what until then had remained invisible. There is more, but you had a question, right? Well, I, it was just a comment really. Um, <clears throat> it was this, this aspect of the campaign that you're describing is, is the first aspect that I came across uh, when I found out about it. And uh, it was exactly this that I found so exciting. You know, I'd been, I was a member of the Communist Party. I, I still am. But the thing that shocked me was that I, I hadn't come across this viewpoint before. And because I'd stayed at home, I, I, did, I wanted to stay at home to look after my baby, but also in a way, it was the only option at that time as well. Um, and it meant that suddenly I couldn't even, because I had a baby, I couldn't even go to, uh, you know, branch meetings because they took place at, at night when I couldn't attend. I wasn't happy anymore going to protests. You know, I did want to take the baby in the sling and I, I'd been in situations where there'd been a lot of, you know, crushing almost, I, I didn't feel safe. and. I also felt that I hadn't um, made a feminine, very feminist choice. So this, that was exactly the thing that excited me about your work and, and the other feminists that you worked with was that it radicalized actually being a mother or being at home and that it gave some kind of, um, suddenly, you know, you, you, give, you give power to that position and you, you made it possible to talk about changing society from, from that position rather than having to leave in it. Yeah, so I was... Yeah, because in the left tradition in the Communist Party and in all the organization of the left, you know, women, they became worker only when they went to work in a factory or they went to work out of the home before they were not worker. So they're all huge amount of work. And this is something very, very important because not only it meant that this organization never saw you know, the work that women do, they never saw the function of housework in the production of the workforce and always looked you know, at the home, not as a place of struggle. You know, the place of struggle is only wage work. And, and Marx, that's all in Marx too. I mean, not only saw that, but they also didn't understand something profound about the capitalist organization of work, about capitalist accumulation as a whole, by not seeing their work, not seeing the unpaid labor that women do, not seeing how the whole capitalist class, every employer has exploited their labor, has uh, benefited you know, by having, by naturalizing this labor, by making it appear as a labor of love, by not recognizing it as work. You know, so by knowing all of this, first of all, they embraced, they legitimated and embraced the capitalist viewpoint. You know, this is really, but also they, they gave us a very distorted image of capitalist accumulation. Capitalist accumulation, you know, takes place in the factories, in the offices, takes place through wage labor. They didn't see that actually the wage organizes the work you know, of the community, organizes the work that takes place in the home. That with the wage, employers you know, employ not only one worker, but more than one worker. They also employ the people who are reproducing them, who are reproducing their capacity to work. So we basically saw that actually capitalist accumulation depends 
on a huge amount on the whole continent of unpaid labor, much, much wider than what the Marxist socialist tradition has ever acknowledged. And we also saw the connection between sexism and racism because we saw that by means of the wage, capitalism has created all this labor hierarchy. The paid workers on the top, mostly white, mostly male, the unpaid worker in the bottom, women, house workers, colonial subject, of course, at the bottom, those enslaved. Slavery has been hugely important for the accumulation of capital. So I think that looking at uh, the question of the discrimination of women from the point of view of reproduction has also given us a different perspective on capitalism as a whole. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the things that I and many others I've spoken to about your work have found inspiring or it just changed everything is exactly what you've started talking about there. Um, the way that you connected um, the work that a woman does privately in her own home and its relation to all unpaid work done everywhere globally and historically and you 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 put that in you know many essays you 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 um, show its centrality to capitalism um i was i was going to ask you to give an overview of those connections but Maybe you already have, or, or do you think there's anything else? No, I, th I think uh, that uh, we saw that in fact, uh, you know, much of basically, again, the analyzing the role of the wage, right? Because uh, first we understood, once we understood the, the significance and uh, what, what uh, reproductive work, housework represents in the organization of work, in the process of accumulation, then we also began to see the role of the wage. And we began to see that the wage is not a compensation for work done or even a way of extracting some unpaid labor you know, from the working day of the, of the wage worker. But the wage is a whole way of organizing society. It's a whole way of organizing society. It's a way of also concealing you know, uh, entire fields of exploitation, you know, by mean of, of uh, describing only certain workers, only wage workers as workers, right? It's a way of, of uh, basically naturalizing and concealing you know, entire, entire fields of exploitation. And in fact, you know, um, we know for instance that Marx was an abolitionist. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the first international campaign very strongly, you know, and organized a boycott of the cotton that was coming during the, the civil war uh, in the United States. You know, Marx wrote a letter to Clinton, to, congr to Lincoln, excuse me, <laughs> to congratulate him, you know, on the Emancipation Declaration. But at the same time, you don't really have in the three volume of Capital, a real analysis, you know, of slave work as producer of capitalist accumulation. There are passages here and there but fundamentally for Marx, the terrain, you know, the terrain of struggle, the fundamental terrain of struggle is, is the, the industri is industrial work. And I think this has to do because <clears throat> Marx saw slavery in the same way he saw domestic work as kind of activities that will be left behind. They will be historically backward and uh, they will be transcended by the future of capitalist development. Well, we have seen that this has not really been the case. That for instance, the abolition of slavery uh, has been more formal than real, more formal than real. And we have seen, for instance, that with the process of globalization, the world expansion of capitalist relation of the last 
you know, 40 years, you know, since at least the late 70s. It led to an expansion of what one calls informal labor. It led to the expansion of all kinds of unpaid activities or informal activities that are outside of the wage relation. And so I think that when we spoke of housework, we took housework as a prism, as a window to look at the capitalist system. I think it was still important. For me, the, the work that we did, you know, in the 1970s, analyzing housework, analyzing wages, uh, was fundamental to decipher, to interpret, and to analyze, you know, the whole process of recolonization that we saw in the 80s and 90s into the present, you know, throughout Latin America, throughout Africa. You know, the work of the IMF, structural adjustment, privatization, et cetera, et cetera. It, it became, I was ab able, it helped me tremendously, the work that we have done because we understood, you know, the importance, you know, for capitalism. First, the question of unpaid labor. Second, the question of hierarchy. Capitalism is a product, producer of differences. Capitalism, capitalist development has to develop continuously new hierarchy, new division. Uh, and capitalism has to always you know, respond to its crisis through massive process of expropriation, massive process of expulsion, you know, from any forms, any means of reproduction. So for us, when Maria Rosa de la Costa says that the housewife is kind of iconic, you know, which of course has to be qualified, but nevertheless, there's something very profound there, you know, iconic in that she's a figure that embodies, right, the unpaid worker. She is the unpaid worker. And she is also the worker who is not recognized as worker, right? who is recognized as a marginal figure or a figure that is destined to be surpassed by capitalist development. On the contrary, we have seen that the expansion of capitalist relation has expanded unpaid labor. You know? So for example, I mean, just one example, but I could make so many others. Students now in the United States, in Europe, as you know, you know, they, they are asked to do enormous amount of paid work under the pretense of gaining skills, of gaining experiences, stagism to do the stage, <laughs> whereby they're supposed, actually they're doing enormous amount. You know, we have, we have actually over the years looked at companies who are laying off workers because now in the pipeline, there is a pipeline, the university are sending them students. This is one example of the expansion of unpaid labor. Um, I think one thing on that topic of unpaid labor that's become more, more apparent during the pandemic is that even if we had this idea that women were somehow emancipated from housework and because we could go out to work now if we wanted to and even some women have been able to earn high wages. Um, what the pandemic showed was that women were still doing most <laughs> of the housework. Um, and my next question is uh, follows on in some way from that. Um, but it's a, it's a long question because I'm trying to frame it in its full context. So Sylvia and everybody else, please stay with me when I ask this question. So the wages for house campaign was a campaign for as you've you know as you've shown now speaking to us it was a campaign for much more than just a wage and um one of the things amongst other things one of the things that it called for was women's autonomy over their own bodies um so mm -hmm. there was a pro-abortion campaign they were anti-sterilization campaigns and also they were campaigns against the medicalization of women's bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a call for women to be able to understand their own bodies and women were taught how to examine themselves. Um, 
And there was also a call for the state to stop controlling women's bodies, for example, uh, in order to um, in order to control birth rates in, in both directions. So with these issues in the background and thinking about the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, across the border in England, though not yet here in Wales, I, I don't think, um, they are discussing making COVID-19 vaccines mandatory for uh, care home staff. And as we know, um, care home staff tend to be women, the majority are women. And in the UK, a large proportion are from the Global South or Eastern Europe. Um, they tend to be a demographic that's uh, wary of this vaccination. Yet here they are, uh, mostly women, greatly underpaid and being told to do something to their bodies that they are reluctant to do. Um, for the good of the for the good of the people, um, you've written you've written about how capitalism has transformed the body into a work machine, and here maybe as an example is an example of the work machine um, being adapted so that it can work better in these particular conditions. Um, on the left, I don't think that we've adequately critiqued this, go the government's response to the pandemic. There have been inflamed discussions between, say, anti-vaxxers and their opponents. Um, but other than that, they on the left, there hasn't really been um, any objections really to how the government has dealt with the pandemic. It's mainly been one of timing, you know, that they did things too quickly or too slowly. So do you think that this is fair enough due to the nature of this crisis? Or do you think that as Marxists, as feminists, as activists on the left, that we need to be asking more questions? Um, if so, what would, the, what would those questions be from a Marxist feminist perspective? And also back to the care workers, how, how does the the current issue facing care home workers, how does that fit into the wider historical context uh, or the wider historical issue of state control over working class women's bodies and the way we respond when, when we don't like it, that they don't agree? Yeah, many questions. And let me quickly say a few things first. You know, yeah, for example, the wages for just before we get to this point, the wages for household campaign, you know, was um, also relating to the whole issue of abortion and the old question when you said sterilization, because we were critical as uh, in fact, many black women organization were of the exclusive accent that was placed by the feminist movement on abortion. Abortion made the right to choose. And we said in order to choose, in order to control our reproductive capacity, we also must fight for the right to have in the United States of black women who have always been denied maternity from slavery to present. You know, slavery, I mean, they were forced to procreate slave to be sold at the, opt at the auction and later many studies so on. So we said, no, control over our body has two sides, a negative one. We want to be free to decide not to have children, but we also want to have the right. And in order to do that, we have to struggle for the resources to say to have that so that we don't have to be dependent on a man for lack of resources. Also, and that's important to state, we have seen that, you know, over the years, women who have gone to take a job outside the home, you know, with some exception, but the majority have taken jobs who are underpaid, very precarious, do not give you autonomy. 
And in fact, in the United States, women who have a job outside the home, working class women, have huge amount of debts. They have to take debts because the wage is never enough. You know, there is a struggle in the United States for $15 an hour, big struggle. Most people make $7 an hour. You have millions of you know, people are making like $15,000 a year. And talk about for instance, immigrant who need to also send some money at home. These are not livable wages. So you have to have loans, you have to have that. This is important to say. And then, and then third point, we have seen that with the pandemic in the United States, five million women have lost paid employment. 2.5 million have left the jobs they had spontaneously, spontaneously, because they had children at home and the school were closed. So the situation is really, very desperate. Very, very, very desperate. Now, when it comes to the question of the vaccine, right? I think it's very unfair that, you know, care workers have to be forced. They have been in a terrible, terrible situation. Domestic worker, you know, those who are doing domestic work for pay. First of all, they're all immigrant women from Africa, the Caribbean island, the Philippines, both in Europe and the US. And they have migrated because their countries have been massively impoverished, if not destroyed by wars, you know, by the politics of the IMF, international capital, the European Union, the United States government, etc. So we have to acknowledge that. And, uh, and now, of course, you know, when, uh, when uh, the COVID epidemic, you know, began, many of them were left out by their families with nothing, suffering not only personally, but also their own family, because often they are supporting families also back home. So there was a situation, terrible situation. And now forcing them to the vaccine, it's also unjust because I believe that there are ways in which they can probably also make themselves you know, safe without necessarily you know, going through the vaccine. About the vaccine, you know, it's very difficult for people like me to have a, a, a proper position because we don't know I'm not a doctor, I've not followed sufficiently, and I'm not, don't have the qualification to understand, you know, what, what is the meaning of this vaccine. But certainly there are certain questions that stand out. One is why we never hear of therapy? Why in all this period, we have never told, never, 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 we have talked about the fact that perhaps there are things that can be done now that can also help. So therapy has been out, completely absent. You know, secondly, we're also not told that as many people have died of COVID, are dying of cancer, but that doesn't seem to be an issue. Because when you're dealing with cancer, you're dealing then with the whole issue of pesticide, you're dealing the issue with the contamination of water, contamination of air. All those issues are also important, you know, in uh, creating the condition for the mortality of COVID. You no, know? so this vaccine, you know, we have seen as a tremendous impact on bodies that have already been weakened. You know, in the majority of cases, older people, black people in poor communities, you know. People are living in areas that are especially contaminated as far as waters and as far as air, you know, in terms of people's lungs. None of this. So now uh, we are sold the vaccine. The vaccine is the, you know, universal 
is the miracle, is the one way, there's nothing else. So we are not told about all the other so-called pre-existing condition. Pre-existing condition is a food that is full of pesticide, an air that is totally contaminated, particularly in many parts of the world, you know, a, a, an environment that is more and more destructive of our bodies. That is not being talked about. And that makes me extremely suspicious that what is at stake is not really a concern for our health, but it's really a concern for the profit of the big corporation. This does not mean that some of these vaccines may not actually produce some immunity. I'm not uh, going to deny that. I don't know. I, I, I imagine they're telling us they do, and I imagine that they will produce. Uh, we are also told not to worry about the long-term consequences. For example, some of these vaccines have uh, impact on the RNA. That's the genetic material. We don't know the consequences. We are told everything is better rather than dying. And so we embrace that philosophy. But I think there are many, many questions. And those questions really center on sanitary system that have been destroyed over the years. The great mortality, it's a political disaster, it's a political crisis. The great mortality could have been avoided if for decades and decades and decades, our hospital, our healthcare, our nutritional system had not been continuously undermined. And I really resent them politically. You know, they now is a vaccine or no vaccine. If you are for the vaccine, you're progressive and revolutionary. If you're against the vaccine, you're a Trump supporter and a fascist. Or even if you raise doubt. And I really resent that now when we go out, the first thing that anybody asks of each other is, were you vaccinated? You know, were you vaccinated? And I think that the discussion has to be a bit more complex. I think that we really, the, the COVID is a moment of truth. It's an important moment of truth. It really brings out, you know, the fact that this system is a very destructive system. It's a system that puts us all in danger, some more than others. For example, black communities, for example, the elderly, for example, you know, people in a uh, former colonial world still treated as colonials, right? And we have seen also the incredible, incredible um, mercenary character of these, of these uh, pharmaceutical companies. They have made their research with public money and now they are making everybody pay, et cetera. And now they are limiting, you know, their right to patent. So there's a lot of issues. And the question is, who is going to set the stage for what is going to come next? Because it's very clear that the capitalist class internationally is going to use COVID for the major restructuring of capitalist development. The World Economic Forum is talking about a capitalist reset. They're saying the COVID is the opportunity for a massive capitalist reset, right? Meaning the form of capitalist development, the organization of work, the distribution of wealth. And I want to know if people who are interested in a different kind of society are also going to organizing for the reset. This to me right now is the question, who is going to decide the post COVID or going to um, basically, how we are go what we are going to do and respond to um, in terms of what is coming next. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Um, I do think that you've touched on, uh, you know, important things there that, that can be quite difficult to discuss because the situation becomes so easily inflamed. But I think you've, I think you've uh, raised points that, that we do actually, on the left especially, need to, need to have a 
a calm and and in-depth discussion about and just to just to go back to your the point you made at the beginning of your answer when you were talking about the conditions that you know of women living that that women live in and the effect of the pandemic on them this is one of the reasons for our campaign it's because it's also the case here in wales that you know many families live in poverty even even with even with two parents working you still don't have yeah. money and so this call for a wage I, I live in a in a working class community where where most of the women or many of the women are, are carers and they don't just care for their own family they care for um you know for neighbors it's still a community where people care for each other so but but at the end of their lives they don't have the protection of a of a wage you know of a pension of they have never earned a proper wage so I just wanted to bring it back to that just to yeah reiterate that this is the reason behind our campaign. I'm also quite uh, conscious of the time. I know that you have to leave Sylvia. So mm -hmm. maybe I will say thank you to you now. And I'll check with Ellen and um, who because I think they were going to see if there's time for maybe a question or two from the yeah, audience. Yeah, I can stay for until for 10. Okay, for 10 yeah. minutes. Okay. Yeah minutes we still have 20 minutes oh for 20 minutes okay so i just wanted to say before i stop talking to you just thank you so much and um it's yeah we're really lucky that we've been able to talk with you and thank you and good luck for your campaign because we need a rechanneling of social wealth we need a rechanneling of resources to be put at the service of our reproduction in terms of housing in terms of health care in terms of social services like child care and care for the elderly. So I think it's extremely, extremely important. And also that there be a broad debate on the forms because we need monetary support, we need services, and, and we need to organize in a way that we have some control. For example, on the, on the quality of the healthcare, on the quality of the services. And, uh, but certainly we cannot have a change unless we reorganize how the social wealth that is produced is used. Now so much goes into war, jails, repression. We need to really, as the women in uh, uh, Latin America say, put it, put it because at the service of life, you know, put, embrace a policy where life is at the center. Yeah, I think that's a good point for me to transfer you to Ellen because it's such a positive point. And I think it's something that we, we really need to remember, uh, you know, in everything that we struggle against, that, that that's really the most important, that that's the most important thing. That's what we always have to strive for. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you so much, Sylvia. It's been such an interesting conversation. I'm just going to read a comment now from one of our audience, Sal, who says, um, when a man bakes bread in a bakery, it is regarded as production contributing to the economy. But when a woman bakes bread at home, it's regarding as consumption, as a drain on the economy. And I thought that was a really good comment. Yeah, it's there. even worse than that. When a man in a factory produces weapons, then it's considered productive. When a woman, you know, takes care of a child, it's not productive. So producing means yes. of destruction contributes, you know, to the society. You know, raising the future generation and fostering life does not. I think that this even more clearly expresses the logic of this system. Yes. Yes, that's very poignant. Thank you. Um, Kathy asks us, um, do you see calls for a universal basic income as a recuperation of a de the demand for a social wage and socialising reproduction? If so, how should we respond? Well, you know, I've said it many, 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 many times, you know, that, uh, that first of all, what are we really talking about? Because there are many right-wing versions of the universal income. For example, you know, one of the first supporters 
of the social of the universal income was Milton Friedman, the father of neoliberalism. He was a staunch supporter because he believes that uh, if uh, government could send every month a check to the poor, uh, then the government could could be authorized to stop any involvement with the reproduction of the workforce. For example, the government could get out of social security, investing in healthcare, any government investment, you'll be like, you know, uh, complete divestment. Yes, exactly, yeah. So we have to be careful. And the other thing that we have to be careful is, you know, to me, I'm against uh, those position that describe the basic income as income without work. Income without work in the sense that the income should be there without additional work. Mm -hmm. Let's make it clear. You know, this is what Wages for Housework was about. You know, we were saying, we are working for you. You have exploited us. Mm -hmm. You are the real beneficiary of our work because you don't have to pay any infrastructure to make people arrive to your job. You are actually appropriating all these energies that you have not done anything to produce, right? So I think it's very important that we put on the, on the plate the fact that, yeah, we are doing a lot of work. This is not charity. This is not, this is not capitalist benevolence. Mm. This is a small part of what they have taken from us. This is restitution for stolen labor. <laughs> yes. So that's very important, restitution. So that, that I think, uh, the formulation you know, of a campaign, that's very important. And, and I guess also um, thinking about universal basic income in that regard, it's a really um, thin line to tread of how do we ensure that providing something like a universal basic income doesn't turn value on its head and mean that people are undervalued even further by corporation and undervalued even further for who they are because it's regarding, regarded as something. Because we saw in the United States what happened to the campaign uh, when women on welfare, they struggled to expand what welfare was about. Mm -hmm. And the government had a good way to present them as parasites. Yes. You know, and hiding the fact that raising children is work. Raising yes. children is a contribution to society. So we have to be very careful. Otherwise it can be turned in a way that is very divisive. Yes. And yes. what they did was to pick you know, the women overtaking welfare from you know the working class saying, oh, they are they are taking this money at the expense of working people. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. Yes, definitely. Um, we had a question over email as well in advance, and this is that question. So I'll, I'll go to that now. Mm -hmm. Is it time to consider childcare as an issue of reproductive justice and beyond social wages for parents and carers? How can we get together to discuss? how we might need to collective to create collective approaches to childcare. Yeah, I think I believe in collective approaches to childcare. Absolutely. I believe that in fact this is the one of the major you know paths to follow to create transform activities, domestic tasks that have been performed individually in isolation into cooperative form. Mm -hmm. The question is also how we make sure that we control the condition. How mm -hmm. we make sure that it's not the state organizing it independently of our say. So it seems to me that it's very important to have this kind of cooperation, but also bringing together women who are in the community and women who are working within the institution. You know, those the childcare workers, and also the women who are in. So this to me is extremely important. Otherwise, we could have childcare you know, services that are parking lots, parking lots for children 
you know, yeah. while their mothers are going out to, to job. All we have childcare services that are so expensive, you know, that when women have a job, half of the money goes into them. I think that's so, the situation we are in here, actually, with the expense of childcare. Is it worthwhile to work? But from what you're saying there, um, a lot of the word control comes back. And how do we frame it? How do we um, make it clear what we're calling for? And how do we keep that control within um, our movement and for women, with women, and that kind of thing? And that seems really important. Do you think that across the time you've been campaigning that that idea of control has been able to be transferred to people, um, um, people to ordinary people strongly enough. Yeah, I know. I think uh, actually, I think that this is one of the issues that goes beyond even childcare, mm -hmm. as we do with every other issue of reproduction. I think that the important one of the most first steps is also creating spaces. You know, in New York now, assemblies are becoming popular, you know, assemblies, but where different people can come together, different women can come together. You know, the women in the community who have children who may not have a job outside the home, and also the women who are working in the services. And I think that out of that coming together, some understanding of what is the kind of service that we want? How, yeah, I think this is the, the political work to be done. Mm -hmm. Political work that has not been done yet in terms of a strong grassroots mobilization, not simply saying the state, or oh, we want the state to set up these services. We, the state has a huge, as our, our wealth in its hands. In their hands, they have all the social wealth. You know, we have seen now, for instance, Biden can say trillion here, trillion there, right? But the question is, I think there hasn't been in the history of the feminist movement, that kind of mobilization, women coming together and figuring out what do we want in terms of childcare? What is that we need? Are we going to make sure that our children, you know, are actually taken care in the way that we want? Yes. How we make sure so that kind of work is the political work that we need to do. That and horizontal that, communication between yeah. the women, I guess there's massive power in that as well, isn't there? Exactly. And those who are working in the services and the women in the community. And this applies not only to childcare, it applies to you know the question of care for the elderly who are not self-sufficient. It applies to health to health care. You know, women coming together with the nurses, those who are working with side, inside the hospital. Most women are not happy with the kind of health care they receive when they go to the hospital. Many women are very scared of going to give birth, particularly yes. women of color, who are often are being humiliated, who are often are not being listened to. When they say, I have this problem, they are not being listened to. Mm -hmm. and so this question, of creating cooperative forms, of not confronting the state alone, yeah. not confronting the state, say, oh, give us this service. No, give us this service, but in ways that we also are participant in the decision, in the kind of uh, decision as to what kind of services. And this must come, it's a process, it's laborious, it's not easy, it means we have to find the time, we have to find the space, but I think it's very necessary. I and there's so, so much value in that process as well, isn't there? So much value. I think that there's a need for a mobilization from below, a grassroots, women's mobilization, of course, men too. It's not only a, a women's issue, but women's mobilization, first of all, and to make the decision is, what is the need? What is that we want? What is that, you know, and, uh, and then acting upon it. Do we have time for one more question, Sylvia? No universal recipe, also. No, of course. Uh, and that's one of the things that we try and address um, in our conversations is how do we create benefits without um, 
enforcing a universal way of working and a way of being so how do we allow people to be yeah. flexible in that I mean, we there have so many tools there are many tools you know people have used also to help none yes. of them is res resolves everything the questionnaires asking women the the town hall meeting now of course everything has to do with zoom but we're going to have a good weather so people can meet in open spaces hopefully yeah of you know of dying of covid <laughs> i'm really looking forward to that to be honest with you uh, yes very much do we have time for another question sylvia one more question yes one more question okay um actually we have time for two if they're brief okay i'm got uh, oh he's asked me a question here he's asked a question that's slightly um it moves on from that in a way um but maybe in a way we haven't discussed yet so oh i asked um, can you highlight what role the expansion of the commons and commoning can have? Yeah, well, this is actually, this is what I've been talking about. Yeah. yeah. This is what I've been talking. This is commoning. This is commoning is commoning means, you know, cooperating and so on, but also, and means breaking down the division. It's very important to understand the one of the great powers of the state uh, has been in dividing us. Yes. So over and over, we continuously face, you know, teachers are placed against parents. Parents are told that the teachers don't care. They only want a paycheck. You know, the teachers are told, well, the parents, uh, you know, they expect everything. They don't understand that we are overworked. Mm -hmm. In the nurses. The, gov the, the hospital administration continuously cuts the number of people, nurses working there. And yes. then when everything goes wrong, tells the family, well, it's the nurses, it's the nurses' fault. So there's always this competition, right? And I think we really, the commoning has to do with creating collaboration in reproduction, but also central to it is refusing, is organizing ways of coming together that addressing specifically those ways in which the state, the government, are actually pitting people against each other. People who have a common interest. The nurses have the same interest, the people in the community, you know, but often they're pitted against, you know, the client, the patient, the families. Same with the schools. Same with the daycare worker. So this is what commoning has to mean. It's a really, it's a really interesting way of focusing what our activity is as well. I think uh, as we go forward, looking at those points where um, the state does try and pit us against each other, and looking specifically to build those bridges and bring people together. So I think that what you say that is so valuable to us as we go forward with our campaign. And, and starving the resources, you know, and always yeah. the stinginess with the resources. They never have a problem when they have to finance more police or where they have to create more people for the armies and for the wars, etc. All new system of control. Right. But when it comes to question of healthcare and so on, then then all, all of a sudden, you know, they are very limited in what they can use. So we have to challenge that. Yes, I, I agree 100 percent. I have I have my very last question then from who yeah. and and he asks us, is there a link between the lack of value placed on caring for family members by women and the extremely low wages paid? To care workers and is there a role to demand proper work oh so absolutely oh absolutely apps and this is where i think i fold the whole left tradition that also has contributed to it you know that actual work is you know the factory worker the blue collar worker that's the worker and you know the ground floor of the factory as the terrain for the struggle against exploitation and for a communist society. So this, yeah, absolutely total devaluation, right? Mm -hmm. This work is to totally, in fact, when women maybe after years of doing housework have to take it, a job outside the home, they have to say that they have no work experience. Yes. 
for a long time, you know, when you had work experience, you had to put none. And we know that housework is not just cleaning the floor, it's 20 kinds of different tasks. It's actually a multi multitasking, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. it's an extremely, and the kind of knowledge, there's a whole knowledge. And I think we see it almost every day. The, what, you know, it's nothing to do with women genes has to do with experience handed down from grandmother to mother to us. That, for example, so many women's experience that what we see, the men don't see. Mm -hmm. What we see in a home, the men don't see. Because there is a tremendous amount of, um, you know, comes from having to do, you know, all these different kinds of tasks. And that creates a knowledge. This is not unskilled labor. This is and not it's, just, it's an empowering knowledge, isn't it, as well? If we can transfer over to women or, or carers or whoever's in the home doing the work, how do you identify your skills? How do you tell them what you can do? Because often right. we're not told how to break down our skills, and that's a way of disempowering as well, isn't it? Exactly, because women have a lot of skills in terms of keeping relation in the family, keeping everybody yeah. content. So yeah. all the emotional labor of resolving the crisis, of dealing with people's fear, all that emotional work, right? Also the budgetary work, you know, being looking ahead and figuring out, you know, what can be spent, what cannot yes. be spent. The nutritional, the fact of uh, thinking about what is the nutritional context. Mm -hmm. having to deal between the nutritional needs and the lack of money, you yeah. know, et cetera. So there's a tremendous, and also try in all of this to use this work to express one's creativity in, within possible, you know, and, and we see uh, su such, such a, I think, uh, humongous level, you know, of, um, of effort that women, traditionally and to this day are doing. And so, you know, I think too often feminists have internalized that evaluation and not seen that terrible, miserable condition. Mm -hmm. So many women have been forced to do this work, you know, is what make this work so oppressive. But that we should not assume that uh, working outside the home is necessarily more creative. Mm -hmm. They bring some money where working in the home does not. But the idea that somehow working outside the home immediately is more social. Uh, every time I travel and I go through an airport and I see those women standing there in front of thousand packets of perfume, <laughs> waiting for the customer, Etc. I think, oh, this is social labor. This is socialized. Yeah. So this is what we, and so many of the jobs the women do now when they go out and work a real extension of housework, a real activities that isolate women as much as if you were in the home. Yeah. There's actually isolating women or women that are in an office without windows all day long with the phone, with the computer. So we really have to rethink, you know, what are the jobs that we think are superior and understand, you know, that uh, we, we could not assume that, for example, necessarily work that is catering to reproduction, you know, is work that is necessarily oppressive, necessarily, you know, to be avoided. It's so it's so valuable speaking to you and yeah. he, hearing you speak about these things and putting, I, I think, words to a lot of what what we read and what we feel. And I, I think Catherine would agree with me. It's so it's so good to hear you articulate um, the arguments and and help us work through them. It's fantastic. Thank you so oh, much, thank Sylvia. You. Thank you it, for it's, it's been a massive, massive. Um, I'm forgetting my words now. Um, but Brian's Catherine. Thank you. No, I understand. I understand. Well, yeah. I'm very happy 
that we've made this content and I want to, you know, greet you that we people are listening to us. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to hear about your campaign. Yes, well, I, I, I'd like to thank on that point, I'd like to thank um, everyone who's been involved in organising this evening. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that um, everyone will jump at the opportunity to update you far too often on what we're doing. <laughs> Very good and all the best. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and so thank you all for coming tonight and thank you all for your questions and um, for listening and I hope you've benefited as much as I have from this conversation tonight and thank you very much Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you to all. Eh? Thank, thank you. you. Bye.